Let's continue examining uh, Bernard Mandeville, the, basically the preface to uh, the Fable of the Bees and an Inquiry. I'm just going through this to help uh, lay the groundwork for you guys to, to read through these works and uh, get, get an idea of what they're about. They're important and very interesting and rather entertaining, especially the Fable of the Bees. Now, remember um, a couple of things that, that I ended on with the last video. Um, that uh, Mandeville is saying, look, a, a key thing, I'm trying to show that to have a wealthy, powerful nation, right, the elegant comforts and this wealthy, powerful society, this nation, to have that and demand that that society, this wealthy, powerful nation, be one of virtue, just pure virtue, to try and put those together, that's impossible. You can't do it. It doesn't work. Reality is just not like that. That is a contradiction and contradictions just don't exist in reality. That's the whole idea. If you say something's a contradiction, it means it's not, it's, it's, it's something that you've stated that you would like, but it isn't real. It can't be real. And that's really what he's trying to drive home here is, is this is like a square circle right? Yeah, I can talk about square circles all day and say, oh, I would love one and I'll sell you one and all that. But they, you, if you say, show me one, I, I can't. They, they don't exist, right? I would love this. Who wouldn't? Alas, it's basically a square circle. And, and to, to, to insist on it and demand it and then say, oh, I want this powerful society and oh, I got a powerful society. Hey, that's great. Oh, look at all the vices and sit there and decry that that's just folly and nonsense and, ir and and unreasonable to behave like that, right? Make a choice. You can't have both, right? So uh, you have to pick one or the other. And then also he goes on to say, look, if you do say, I want this great virtuous society, I don't want to talk about aggregating vices. I hate all that stuff. I just want everybody to be virtuous. Well, Jupiter comes down and makes all the bees virtuous and it's a disaster. So a society without vices, it's not going to be this right? Yeah, you can get a society maybe without vices, but I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's not going to look like that, right? So if you like your creature comforts and all that stuff, and you want to have a society without vices, then you might have to make a choice and have a very uh, uh, different kind of society. And we'll look at this a little bit later in the video, because he's going to do another thought of experiment, but he's going to say, alas, it's not really real either. Okay, so he says, qui uh, bono? Whose benefit is this discussion? What good will this discussion provide? Well, first off, he says, not really any goods out of this. Um, it's going to provide a little entertainment for the readers. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, but no real goods. But maybe, and he hedges his bets because, you know, he says, look, um, what's the odds that, that uh, uh, you know, given, given how much moral philosophy is produced? And, and think about it. He's saying this in the 1700s. Like all the moral philosophy, oh my God, there's so much stuff written, telling us, talking to us, telling us what to do, how to be good and all that. And according to Mandeville, he says, it's had almost no effect, right? And, you know, you could ask that question if all of this uh, uh, stuff hadn't existed, like if all these works of, uh, of ethics and morals hadn't have existed, how much different would things be? It's, it's a tough question, especially for philosophers of myself to ask. But as philosophers, we must ask the tough questions. It's a good one. And Mandeville basically says, nah, it probably wouldn't uh, uh, have, have done any, uh, it probably wouldn't be all that different, right? Because he says, you know, and why does he conclude that? Because he infers from the what he thinks is a fact that people haven't really changed human nature. Again, it's a human nature-based argument where it's a constant there has been all kinds of stuff trying to improve human nature, trying to make it better, giving all this advice, all this moral, moral stuff, moralizing, moral philosophy, you name it. We've thrown everything at human nature to try and make it better. And is it any better? Mandeville says no. So what are the odds that, uh, that you know, speaking as Mandeville, what are the odds that my little fable of the bees are going to, uh, that this, the odds that, that, that my fable of the bees is going to have a big impact? Well, very little. And it's probably not going to have really any impact at all. So to my critics, he says, don't don't get all upset. It's like it's not going to help anything and it's not going to hurt anything either. It's really you're getting upset over pretty well nothing. It's just another little pamphlet lighten up. So um, and again, so he keeps a sense of humor and, and there is a kind of irony and a, and a sort of jovial side to his, his writing. 
But nonetheless, he does think, well, you know, maybe, maybe if readers read this and you really think about this, and you think, geez, I've been kind of wanting all this and I demand this. Maybe I'm being unreasonable. Maybe I'm not being thoughtful. And in the end, maybe I'm just being a big hypocrite. And lots of societies that are rich and powerful, they are accused of hypocrisy. They are, and its members are often accused of hypocrisy. There's no shortage of that in this day and age. And Mandeville, he's in the 1700s pointing this out, you know, that, uh, um, and we'll see, he points it out even further uh, in a second here. So he says, look, it might make uh, readers a little less judgmental. So those of you who want purity and all that stuff, and you want everybody to be so virtuous, maybe you should start looking at yourself a little bit. Um, and that, wasn't that one of the big messages that we've seen in all these videos on hypocrisy is the, the notion of unconscious uh, hypocrisy, right? Remember in, in, if you go back and think about the, all the scraps that, that Jesus had with the Pharisees, one of them was the un, un, notion of unconscious hypocrisy. So it's not always really lying, which is consciously propagating falsehoods, but it can be unconsciously using do, double standards, unconsciously propagating falsehoods. And so Jesus said, look out for that, because that will endanger your immortal soul. And uh, Mandeville is picking up on that, saying, look, you know, Maybe you've got this, uh, you, you should have a look at your own conscience, what you're doing. And maybe we'll get less hypocrisy. Maybe if you examine your own conscience, there'll be a little less unconscious hypocrisy. You'd be a little, that is, you'd be a little less judgmental, a little less demanding. You'd lighten up a little bit and be a little bit, in the end, a little more realistic so that you don't demand the impossible and get all mad when you can't have it. Okay. He also has another thing that, look, you know, maybe uh, there's a kind of uh, the notion of the limits of government or the limits of society. You know, maybe uh, those of you that are enjoying a good life, but you're mad that you're not enjoying an even better life. Maybe you're being unrealistic. And it's also a warning, uh, in, in a sense, a warning to those of us who are uh, who are citizens in in societies and we are bombarded with promises from politicians that we should be like, hey, I'm not going to be duped by that. You're promising me stuff that really cannot be delivered, right? So that's another thing that comes out of this. There's no such thing as perfection, right? Be a little bit more realistic. It's, 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 it's unrealistic to demand this and this at the same time. Maybe it's also unrealistic to demand that your society be really all that perfect and I get to enjoy more things than I already enjoy. Maybe you're enjoying pretty well the limit as a society can provide. Maybe you're in, maybe you're in as good as it gets territory. Mandeville is suggesting this. What would that look like? He doesn't really say, but it's something that I think is a good thing to keep in mind, right? Am I being unreasonable in my expectations? Am I, as Mandeville would say, am I full of folly and unreason? when I demand certain things from my society. Maybe they're just our limits to government. And as people started studying government more from an economic angle and things like that, this notion of real limits started to come into play in the science of, of uh, economics, right? There's just limit, there's limitations. Like, I don't know, limitations on how much wealth and money there is to use in order to do stuff. Okay, um, however, however, he says, you know, just because, uh, uh, there is, there are vices and that, that they're a part of the story and we can't get rid of them. That doesn't mean we just ignore them and let them, as he says in, in his discussion, grow into, you know, morph into uh, uh, crime and that we just let crime unchecked. So he certainly wouldn't uh, accept an argument that said, oh, well, you know, just doing the vice thing and I can do what I want now with my vices and in the end it'll all balance out. He's not saying anything like that. He's saying, look, you know, people can still try to improve themselves. It's still better for society to uh, try and tone down its vices. It's just we shouldn't be unrealistic and demand that we get rid of all of them um, and do, uh, you know, insane things which can happen when people get too carried away trying to purify society. Uh, history shows lots of examples of what happens when you have that runaway uh, cases of morality and it lapses into moralizing. That can be very dangerous and can be extremely it makes a society much more likely to be hijacked by really staunch ideological interests. So he's warning about that, 
right? So uh, we still fight fire, crime with corruption, but we don't want to slide into this kind of demand either, that we're going to fight it and uh, kind of defeat all crime and we're going to get rid of all vice. That's unrealistic and arguably a kind of danger uh, to try and do that. Now, uh, later on, he says, uh, he, he moves a bit. And, and what's very nice is the way he wraps this up is he moves to a dynamic, concrete kind of model of the hive, right? So he said, you know, we're talking about the bees, and then he talks about Jupiter coming in and listening to the bees and getting sick of their whining and then doing something. But he's also giving us a dynamic uh, model of this hive, and in this case, the hive is London. So this is, you know, 1700s, uh, early 1700s, and London, by standards today, would, would, be, would look quite different, and it would be quite rough. Um, but let's 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 just hear him out. He says, "Look, um, uh, uh, let's think about uh, uh, about London, and um, if you were to walk around it, right? Consider this: if you walk around London, and if all you're thinking about are is is yourself, your your personal your personal space, so to speak. So you're thinking about the the things you directly see, the the, the sounds and the smells, right?" And, and, your, and your clothing, right? Now, why does he bring the, all this in? Well, if you're walking around London at this time, he freely admits, like, you're going to go, this place is a dump, right? It stinks, you know? I, I, the, the smells, of the, the, you know, the sewer system, well, what was there for a sewer system? Not, nothing that we would, we, we would be too fond of today. Um, and also, you know, you're, you're, you know, there's animal droppings everywhere, uh, daubing the streets, as he says. You know, there's horses, you know, you know, smashing up the pavement, slamming on things, and and daubing the streets with their droppings all the time. Um, it's a mess, and it reeks, and and you know, they can't really clean it that well. They can try, but they can't really, you know, manage this to perfection. It's unrealistic, right? It's unrealistic. So yeah, who wouldn't look at that and go, oh, what a dump? right? I hate this place. Uh, we got to do something. Now, he says, on the other hand, if you broaden your perspective, right, if you move from the personal and you look at it from a larger uh, uh, society, you're going to start uh, thinking uh, differently. You're going to start saying things like, okay, well, a lot of this, the, the smells that, oh, that was foul. Yeah, it comes from uh, animal droppings and horses droppings, but those horses were just wandering around doing nothing. They were working. They, you're, you're smelling uh, uh, sort of that thing that's offending you from, of, the, of all the droppings. Well, those were the horses that were used to bring in, I don't know, to transport bread or flour to the bakery, right? Those trucked, we say trucked in, those horsed in the, the flour. Um, and, and so that beat the roads up a bit and dirtied them up a bit, but that's how they were making bread because there's thousands of people, as he said, swarming everywhere in the city and they got to eat. Right. So in order to have uh, them eating and not facing starvation, you got to bring a lot of flour in. So you're going to need a lot of horses and they're going to make a mess. Right. And it's going to smell and all that. But that out of that will come bread so people can eat. Um, and what about these other stinks that aren't animal droppings? Well, that might be from a tanner's. Right. Somebody works with leather or whatever in order to have the, uh, the ability to make the shoes that you're wearing or the jacket or whatever. You know, so dyeing and all these kinds of things like dyeing is in dyeing clothes and, and, you know, working with leathers and fabrics and all that. It's horrific. But again, the horses are going to have to pull that stuff in. There's chemicals that are used. It makes a terrible smell and they're sloshed into the streets and you try to keep it clean. But all the disgusting stuff that you're seeing is a byproduct of the things that are being made. So, you know, clothing and bread and all that, all these goods, these good things, they have these waste products. So you can't just, oh, I want to make bread, but I don't want to have, uh, uh, you know, any horses that are needed, or I want good clothes and all that, but I don't like the manufacturing side of it. That's unrealistic. Like, wh wh where is it going to come from? It doesn't just pop out of the air. Okay, so that's Mandeville's point. And it's a dynamic one. Things will change and, and, and all these things over time and the city will stink in one way in the morning and one way in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at it as a global thing, you'll say, yeah, I'm walking around and everything's a stinking mess. And, and every moment, as he says, there's new filth. Yeah, it's disgusting. But 
if I look at it from a large thing, London is a highly functioning city. There's wealth. There's all kinds of things. Yeah, it's a little rosy-eyed on his part. But I think you get the picture, the argument he's trying to make. How successful it is, you can think that through for yourself. But but he's just trying to say that, uh, look, you know, with all these uh, goods that come about, you don't get bread without some kind of uh, trucking in uh, of, of the flour. And we face the same things today, right? We want lots of goods and services and all that stuff. But in order to get those goods and services, there are there's an offloading that's done, right? There, you know, you don't get a good delivered to your doorstep by uh, by a very famous company without uh, you know it, it's got to get it there somehow. Okay, so um, so that's his point. And then he says, well, okay, uh, if we really look at that from a broader perspective, these are evils, but they're necessary evils. They're just part of the story. You can't you can't uh, uh, get around it. New filth. Fine, but a responsible, thoughtful citizen who has, which basically is taking the broad uh, uh, perspective on all this, will say it's a necessary evil. Yeah, it stinks, but hey, that's uh, that's uh, that's that's what they're making clothes right now, right? And so, uh, so that's uh, Mandeville's sort of final thought on that. And then he lapses into a little bit of a, a thought experiment, and he says, "Well, of course, yeah, once again." Would I rather walk around a stinking London street or go into a park? Of course, I would prefer a park. Yes, that's why we build parks. Um, and parks can become part of cities, but cities can't become parks. That's unrealistic, right? So we make those things. That's why it's a little oasis. That's why it's a getaway. We make this thing, um, but it takes all this other infrastructure to support it. A park, we couldn't have a park and that's it right? Who would we pay to clean it or whatever? So these kinds of problems, he says, you know, you, you can't solve them, but you can get little good things like a good, like a park. And of course, I would rather walk through the park than walk down a stinky street. And so we'll then do that if you can. Go to the park and avoid this, the street. But uh, don't think that you can eliminate the street and still have the park or just have your city as a park. Okay, so uh, he says that and he says, of course, of course, yeah. But this is an interesting point that he ends on, and I think it's highly relevant to us today. And it goes something like this. He says, look, um, if you ask me, what would I rather have? A rich, powerful nation that's, uh, uh, you know, doing like like w what it's doing um, or something else? Here's something else I might prefer. If I could have a society I might prefer this. If I could have a society that um, really lays down all its weapons and all that, and everybody lives in harmony, no one is envious of anybody, everyone is content, everyone is happy, the society, here's another interesting point, the society lives totally off its own resources. So um, it's, not, it's not sending an army to go anywhere and get stuff by the sword, by, you know, putting uh, uh, its, its army swords in foreign nations. Um, and it's not bringing back goods from foreign nations so that the, uh, the locals can indulge in those goods, right? So we know what he's talking about here. It's basically old colonialism, right? He's saying, yeah, that's bad. And if I had a society that lived on its own, it was rural, self-sufficient, lived in its own location, didn't bug anybody else, you bet I'd prefer that. Um, rather than, you know, this marauding, conquering society that then, in the end, debauches itself, quote, on foreign luxuries. Um, he's like, yeah, this would be, uh, uh, th this is great. I would prefer this. This isn't realistic because you would have to give so much up that most people just really aren't willing to do. You would have a very simplistic kind of low level. You wouldn't have a technologically advanced society. Um, and he doesn't think that people would, would generally go for it. Now, maybe they would. But he's saying that you, you can't, once again, if you wanted something, you, can't, you still can't put these together. So if you were to have this little ideal society, which he doesn't think is really realistic, keep in mind that all, a lot of these comforts, they would go. And they would be, as he says, uh, as Mandeville wants to point out, a lot of the comforts, like maybe you couldn't even have, now he wouldn't have had it then, but 
you know, think about it. You know, if you had this simple kind of society, maybe you don't get to have the internet anymore. Maybe you don't get to have it or as much as you want or, or very little. You don't have electricity that much. It's too hard on the environment to generate it. It's too exploitative of some other region or someone else to have the goods that you have grown, that you think of as part of your natural uh, infrastructure that, you know, it's just a utility like running water. And maybe that one would have to go. You don't get running water anymore in this ideal self-contained society. Mandeville is telling us that to avoid our unconscious hypocrisy and realize that we are faced with choices.